This is the path leading to your final product. You show that you now it's a stepwise type mechanism. I talked about in this case uh, um, that you might also have the other type of regio isomer. Instead of at, uh, attack that sulfur first, you might also be able to have attack that carbon, which is the, the reasonable thing to think when you look at addition to a CX double bond. So but if you look at the activation barriers, uh, it's more than 5 kcal difference between the initial attack at the carbon versus the initial attack at the sulfur. And these are the two uh, approach transition states leading to the two different uh, diastomers, which are separated by more than one kcal as well, which corresponds very well to the observed diester selectivity of uh, the reaction we were using this style diagonal file. The reason for the preference of these type of reactive isomer versus this uh, we were able to deduce by looking at the bond distances uh, of the dienophile uh, during the transition state. Basically, what you observe in these two cases is that this bond, this single bond is significantly shortened. And of course, this single double bond is slightly lengthened, but not by much. And also, the carbon-oxygen double bond is lengthened slightly. Whereas in this case, you have a lengthening of the CS bond uh, but the cr more crucial carbon-carbon bond over here remains more or less the same as your starting material. What this tells us is basically in this case you have a delocalization of your anion across this entire system over to the more electronegative oxygen atom. So you, you can look at this system as a conjugate addition at sulfur, whereas in this you have basically a 1-2 type addition to a CX double bond. Over here, it's more like a conjugate addition to a alpha, beta, unsaturated system where instead of a carbon, have a sulfur atom. And that's why you have a such a much lower activation barrier for this type of reaction. So basically studying this, we were able to make a rationale for why you have this regio isomer. And in order to, to show this, even prove this even further, we looked at the even more truncated system. If you have thioformaldehyde, now it favors attack at carbon by 7.4 kcal, so huge preference. If you add one of the substituents back, now the difference, the, the delta delta G, uh, drops, but it still prefers attack at carbon first. But if you add on the carbonyl, uh, carbonyl uh, substituents over here, now suddenly you will prefer attack at sulfur. So this basically gives a strong indication that is the delocalization of the anion that gives us the reactivity. And overall, then, we can summarize everything. We can summarize just to know that it's not a concerted. It's a stepwise uh, mechanism through a sweet ionic species. Um, and the regio uh, isomers are basic or add sulfur or add carbon preference is given by uh, the delocalization of the negative charge, basically a stabilization of the Twitter ionic species. If you look at attack at carbon here first, you cannot find a stepwise mechanism. You only go through a concerted mechanism and the activation barrier is around 20. Okay, Cal. So that is the, making the difference. That is the thing that makes the reaction work, and that is also the thing that gives us the selectivity. Yeah? We finished off by calculating, of course, the difference of preference of, of the two phases of the, of the trinamine system. You also have a reasonable separation between the two sub transition states. And overall, you basically know that n selectivity it is really from the steric, bowel hin uh, steric hindrance of the pi system, regio selectivity I talked to you about, and diastereo selectivity, I think, I believe, is the uh, sum of steric and electrostatic effects. In this case, with the thiodiosolder, the separation was so small that it was difficult to find uh, geometry differences. It was not very much, but you could imagine, for example, that going from one of the phases to carbon sulfur, uh, and then you have the sulfur to methyl, and methyl group has two, three protons, which will generate a bit of steric clash, wherever and from the other side, you have a more flat system, you have a more extended system until you have the methyl uh, CSP3 carbon. And that is basically the thing that gives you steric clash. And this is 
place a bit further away when you go with this group endo to the dying system versus using this group endo to the dying system. And that might be the thing that gives you the diastereo selectivity. So by summarizing all of this, I hope that I'll give you uh, a small impression that small things and small marginal things together gives you the activation, but it also gives you the possibility to remote functionalize centers using amino catalysis in a highly enantioselective way. And I'll just by finishing off by re re just briefly go into some of our interest in radical type chemistry uh, that we have because we want to incorporate radical chemistry in asymmetric catalysis. We're on the way, but not there yet. And on the way, we saw a couple uh, of interesting reactivities, and we were able to do small projects, summarize small projects, all of this. And our interests, of course, first that we we were reading literature, but we were also invited to look into the mechanism of one of these reports, which is uh, a paper uh, which we jointly collaborated uh, and, uh, and published um, together with a group in Wuhan in China where they looked at the ipso hydroxylation of boronic acid using a, a redox, photo redox catalyst, uh, which reduces oxygen in the solution, in the organic solution, to oxygen superoxide, which proposed in the mechanism reacts with the boronic acid forming you this species, radical species, and upon either hydrogen abstraction or second reduction, you form this peroxy species, which upon rearrangement and hydrolysis forms you the phenol. It's basically a way to fixate oxygen in the solution and use it as a reagent in uh, organic synthesis. We were looking at this, and, and one of our colleagues was comp uh, making computations on these reactions. And I was trying to study to see if this really occurs between the radical species and or and not a hydrogen peroxide species. So basically what we were doing is that I, I looked at, I, I look at the, the reduction and back oxidation of oxygen you know, using cyclic voltrometry, where you see that you, you, uh, this is the, the cathodic uh, peak where you reduce this. Uh, oxygen to the superoxide and then back oxidize the superoxide back. Uh, in the presence of 1A, 1A is, is phenylboronic acid. This anodic peak starts to disappear more and more depending on the concentration of boronic acid. Within the time frame of uh, the CV experiment, you could see as close that we will be able to come to see that boronic acid is interacting. We, know, we don't, do not know that that's the reaction leading to the product, but we know that they actually combine to form a common species and thereby take out, uh, the, uh, take out the superoxide, which otherwise will be oxidized back to oxygen in this experiment. And so we were looking at this, we see, okay, this really goes through the radical mechanism, but at the same time we thought maybe we can also use this type of electrochemistry to, to, use, uh, to, do, chemis to do synthetic chemistry. Instead of using ruthenium uh, and visible light to fixate oxygen in solution, why don't we just use two electrodes to do this? And we were able to do this uh, with a constant current in a divided cell, giving three electrons per molecule of boronic acid. That was giving us the best result because you always lose, you lose some efficiency during the reaction. But we were able to see that this reaction works pretty well, giving us similar chemical yields compared to the ruthenium catalyzed approach. And this, you do not need ruthenium catalyst, you do not need light, you just need two electrodes which you can you reuse again, 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 and again. So this is a small, uh, small introduction uh, step into radical type chemistry and combining organic electrochemistry with synthetic uh, chemistry. The second thing we were, we were looking at, because now we were reading so much literature about photoredox catalysis, uh, is that in photoredox catalysis, you always look at this reaction. There, this was a reaction that has been looked on upon again and again, a dehalogenation type reaction or deoxygenation or decarboxylation reaction, basically reduction of a CX bond to the CH bond. Uh, and of course, you do not need to do it via, uh, via ruthenium iridium catalyst. You can do it the old fashioned way simply by like tin hydride species. You can use it by heat and AIBN. You can use UV uh, or oxygen initiation. You can do the same thing. But the problem in these cases are that you have worse functional group tolerance. If you have a, a carbonyl compound or a isolated olefins, they will not be tolerated 
a lot of time when you're using these type of conditions. You can using this type of conditions, but then you need, I mean, still, it might not need a lot of resilience. You, might need, you still might need one, two, five more percent. So we were thinking, why don't we combine the advantages of these two? And instead of doing a controlled redox reaction, let's do a radical chain reaction by using the ruthenium not as a catalyst, but as an initiator of the reaction. So if we can use visible light and a trace at 0.1, 0 0.01% of the ruthenium uh, to trigger a radical chain reaction in the presence of a hydride source, which you usually use over here, and then you will be able to do this type of chemistry much more efficiently with lower ruthenium loading. So combine the advantage of visible light type read, photo redox catalysis with uh, the advantage of radical chain type reaction and hopefully keep the functional group tolerance that you see over here. Uh, but what we really realized in this approach is that we saw that you really did not need the ruthenium, uh, ruthenium or iridium catalyst. By using, this is tri, uh, tris trimethylsilane. It's a byproduct in, uh, in, in some industrial processes. It's a known and excellent hydride source. But when you use this uh, and you irradiate it by using a normal compact fluorescent light source, you will be able to do this reaction methyl and additive free. And we did a lot of serious control experiments, other glassware, nothing, and even without the stirring bar, and so on and so on. We were, this reaction went perfectly fine. Maybe there's a trace uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the stock solution of this, but we tried different manufacturer, different, uh, different batches. There's absolutely no difference in the reactivity. What we were also able to see is that you can actually use air atmosphere or oxygen in the air atmosphere to initiate this reaction instead of using ruthenium or so on. Using oxygen to initiate is known in literature. But people know that oxygen initiates the reaction, but it also inhibits the reaction, depending on the concentration. So what you people you should do is that people put a balloon of oxygen with a needle down to the solution and that small diffusion of energy, uh, oxygen into the degas solution, that gives, you the react that gives you the initiation. You have more than no reaction at all. And, and we were looking at this system, we thought maybe this is, uh, maybe th and this is possible by using air atmosphere, by heating it a bit or by doing different type of things. And we, sh we showed that using a heat, uh, an air atmosphere in a closed vessel, heating it slightly to 40 or 50 degrees, you have full conversion of your product. At 30 degrees, no reaction at all. If you bring it up to 40 or 50, you have full conversion of your starting material to a desired product. And efficiency is very similar to what you will get here, and it will also be very similar to what you get up here. And we show that you can do it for activated substrate. If you have a, e electron withdrawing groups over here, uh, and CX bond is efficiently reduced, and also shantase and so on. You have aromatic uh, halides. Iodized is very efficient. Bromide reacts very sl much slower, and chloride is inert to the conditions. And fun now, in this case, the functional groups, such as if you have an aldehyde, you have a terminal olefin or an alkyne, they will be untouched in these type of conditions. You can also do alkanyl substrate, you can do a simple alkylic substrate, alkylic bromide. What we also show is that if you have like a thesis the structure, if you have a double bond or triple bond in proximity to the generated radical, you are able to trap this radical and form and uh, do ring annulation type chemistry. You will be able to do uh, we showed it only for these two examples, but probably you can do it for a range of other type of structures. And this is, of course, no metal and no other additive, only the silane source, only the substrates. Air, air heating, or shining with a compact fluorescent light. So as to show, it, it went very dif differently from where we anticipated it to go, but in the end, we were able to develop hopefully useful methods for this type of reactions or useful al or and complementary alternatives to this type of chemistry. So I speed it up. I spoke very fast because I wanted to have more time for this slide because during the time, um, and I always say this and, and I'll repeat it again and some of you already heard this, it's always so little time to thank so many for so much. Um, of course, our boss and our mom in our lab, 
and we always have to think, and they, they are special. They, have, they get a box for themselves, financial support, of course, but a lot of the collaborator, Masu, uh, work with me on a couple, uh, we work together on a couple of the projects, and some of, and a lot, I think the list is longer than this. I have to update this list even further for some of the more current projects, but really a long list of very highly qualified, good co-workers contributed together and then in a team, and we were able to produce all of these results. And hopefully, thank you for listening, hopefully that will attract some of your interest, at least in parts, and I will be happy to any, take any questions after, just after I take a bit of water, and, uh, and uh, yeah, I will be able to take any questions that you might have. I heard you will have one question each for me. Thank you.